Hello everyone, welcome to the show Meet the Global Leader. This is an initiative by School of Entrepreneurship Development. Under this initiative, we invite many skilled professionals, leaders, consultants and entrepreneurs. Today we have someone with us who is taking the consulting company Yes Impact to a new height. Please welcome Louis Amersham. Thank you so much for having me here. It's a delight to have you with us tonight. So, um, Louise, we would love to know about your background, about yourself, and where you have completed your education from, and how was your childhood? <laughs> I had a beautiful childhood. I grew up in the capital of Germany, which is Berlin, and it was a very multicultural world over there. So I grew up with anything from um, Indians, Arabic people, um, African people, and it really I learned a lot about their stories as well. So I learned a lot about their home countries, and it really ignited the wish in myself very early on that I wanted to work with different cultures, but also solving some of the global challenges they face. Um, I did study in, uh, in Holland, Singapore, and in Spain, international relations. And uh, my studies were focused on international relations and then later human rights and law in my master's. Um, and I absolutely loved it. But for me, it was more about, I loved the theoretical study, but it was really about going deeper. And I realized that by only learning about things, I'm not going to get too far. So I really wanted to start volunteering and interning around the world to also learn uh, more about how to yeah, tackle global challenges, basically. Great. So uh, from, from there, what led you to start uh, Yes Impact? Well, so for me, I spent a lot of years, uh, especially in my like late teen, teenage years and as well in my 20s, where I worked in international organizations around the world. I volunteered in South Africa in the slums. I worked for the International Criminal Court in Cambodia. And um, later I joined an NGO in Switzerland, um, the Salvation Army that was globally active. But I could feel that um, NGOs, there's a lot of good things they do, but also sometimes I felt it was not very effective, the work. And I wanted to see how we could get different players together to actually achieve change in society. So I was curious about the role that um, corporations, for example, could take, um, new technologies, also investment professionals, and how we could bring all these together to create real change. Um, so this is why I founded my company, Yes Impact, to really make sure that we do bring these players to the table and that we can use all of their expertise to um, see how we can find solutions in the world. Great. So what inspired you to, uh, inspired you to start being active in international development and social impact from such a young age? <laughs> I think um, hearing my friends' stories and their parents as well, I think, um, and also reading, like I've always been a very um, passionate reader. So I would read books around the whole world and about different stories of people's lives. And I was very fascinated with a lot of things I learned about poverty, about lack of education, um, but also about like one of the first books that inspired me a lot was um, Bang from Bangladeshi Muhammad Yunus. Uh, the Nobel Peace Prize winner. So um, his book about um, social business and microcredits, that really inspired me and I wanted to go deeper into that. That was definitely one of the triggering factors there, yeah. Amazing. So, uh, implement the... And would you uh, describe that yes, in can you repeat the question? You were half gone by sound. How do you approach finding innovative solutions to implement mm -hmm. the institution? Uh, that is a good question. Um, I like to bring different players to the table. So um, when I was a student, uh, which is about 10 years ago now, um, people were less interested in sustainable development goals, sustainability in general, and social impact. It was still seen as like a um, not so necessary thing. But nowadays you have even people that are in technology companies or big corporations, they're more interested in these topics. So I like to bring them to one table and then to really see that everyone can bring their expertise in. So for example, with my friends as well, I like to pitch them a problem. Like I have projects in Uganda, for example, for Yes Impact. And I will tell them about my experience. And of course they find it fascinating and intriguing. 
but I'll, I'll tell them, for example, once we had the problem that um, I have saving groups and microcredits over there, um, but at some point a pig, a local pig would eat the records of um, our saving groups. So I told it to a friend of mine, he said, hey, why don't you use blockchain technology? Because he's a blockchain expert. And this is how we started collaborating and found a really innovative solution to a problem that microcredits have had for a long time, which is paper records versus digital records that are um, uncorruptible, yeah. Could you tell us about a challenging project you have worked on or, and how you have overcome those challenges? Hmm. I think one of the most challenging ones I work on is um, the whole gender topic. So anything that is um, the female founder and investor space as well. We work a lot with gender discrimination, but also not just gender, but also um, people with a migrant background or people with a different ethnic, uh, ethnic background, um, how they are discriminated as entrepreneurs in the investment world. So anyone that's more diverse than just a white, older, guy basically um, and for these um, what we've done is um, because a lot of them are underfunded so what we have done is create networks for them so we have one community for people with a migrant background uh, that work in tech for example entrepreneurs we have another one that's focused on female founders and we work with four pillars for them so the first one is community second one investment then mentoring and knowledge um, and also uh, visibility so working with these four pillars and that gives them really like a lot of drive a lot of visibility funding for their entrepreneurs of diverse backgrounds and that's how we tackle that amazing so uh, how do you ensure the projects you implement in different countries are culturally sensitive and appropriate working with local expertise so if you're have my face basically you get accused of white saviorism a lot if you're working in different countries um for because people are scared that you're going to impose your your values basically um but what we do is just work as facilitators and really making sure that with any project i have in a different country um it's always local expertise we work with so it's not me going over teaching or something like that but finding the right people on the ground that have the knowledge, for example, entrepreneurship trainers or finance trainers, and um, bringing them into, for example, facilitate a workshop or start a program. Um, I think that is a very good perspective. And then listening, listening, listening. So again, not imposing what I'm thinking could be good for a country, but really making sure that, um, yeah, local expertise is heard and you really bring those people together, yeah. Hello? Yes, so here. I'm you sorry. see me? Yes, there might be some technical problems. Uh, uh, so, yeah, my next question. I can hear Daka in the background. <laughs> now you're frozen. Now you're back. You were gone for like 30 seconds. There might be some problems. Let me check. Now it's perfect. Uh, how do you ensure the entrepreneurs you support have the skills and resources that they need to be successful in their businesses? I think the first thing is making sure that an entrepreneur knows where to find support. And that's such a crucial one. When I started Yes Impact, I was completely lost. I had nobody to speak to. I had no resources. I had no information as well on where to find this. So I had to learn everything from scratch. So I just Googled everything. I contact, contacted people where I thought they could maybe help me. So for me nowadays, I'm a mentor to a lot of entrepreneurs around the world. And it's very important for me that they know where to find information. So information on how to get funding, for example, or um, to take them to the next le level, acceler accelerator and incubator programs, um, just for, for them to have an overview, but also community so that they know from the get-go whatever problem they have there's a lot of other entrepreneurs they can speak to some people are more advanced uh, than them already um, and i think that is really effective just having a strong community around you i also gave a ted talk about it exactly that topic your empowerment and support circle your yes circle 
um, really having that and reaching out as well whenever you feel like you need help. Great. So first uh, of collaboration, so how do you approach building partnerships with other organizations and stakeholders in the communities where you work? First of all, understanding what their objectives are. So what do they want out of the collaboration and really getting a good feel of their identity. So what are their values? Are our values aligned as well? I think that's such a key thing. What is their style of work? That's super important to me because I like efficiency and being reliable. Um, but yeah, really being um, open to their style as well and um, then having clear targets together. So really discussing what is it they bring to the table? What can I bring? Um, where do I need help as well? Is there somebody else that we need to get involved to achieve our targets? Um, and I think that really makes for an effective collaboration and then good communication. It's the same like with any partnership in your life, be it your boyfriend, your friends or whatever, um, or your business partnerships, you need good uh, communication and open communication. So if you realize that something like you're late on a deadline or something, communicate it early so the crisis can be managed early as well. I think that makes for really good um, collaboration and then also really valuing each other. So um, don't take their credit basically. Like whenever we had a great project, I will always mention all of our partners, who is responsible for what, so they get more visibility as well. I'm a keynote speaker, so I present at a lot of stages, so I will have visibility anyways, but I make sure I mention my partners as well, so they get um, the credit as well. Excellent. So how do you measure the impact of the you implement and what metrics do you, do you use? We orientate ourselves with the SDGs, so which SDGs we target, and then the indicators. So you have about 170 indicators that you can use. Um, and then we work with both like directly the community members, for example, qualitative and quantitative analysis. Um, but I also really like just hearing the stories and seeing what impact we have there. Okay. So can you tell us about the project you implemented that you're particularly proud of? Um, I think definitely our first Uganda project. So it was actually during COVID that I started with emergency aid in Uganda because they, they were not allowed to leave the houses. They couldn't work properly. Um, a lot of them were starving. But then after we did emergency aid, um, we were thinking about how can we design a project that's more long lasting. And microcredits was an idea, but we wanted to create something that was more um, independent and self-sustaining and more carried by the community themselves. So what we did was village saving and loan associations, which is super similar to microcredits. They get the business education and um, the financial education. But after that, they don't get an external credit loan, but they raise the funds within their own community and they take the loans from within the community. So this project has really created, first of all, lots of community, lots of support for one another. Um, people started helping each other in all different aspects of their lives as well, um, which was so much more effect than I expected. And of course, a lot of entrepreneurs started from it, a lot of small businesses. Um, I visited them about half a year ago and I could see that um, they really like a lot of them lifted their families out of poverty. They're a lot happier. There was a lot of women empowerment as well. Um, also the men who became entrepreneurs. And I think that was extremely powerful. And from that project, um, we got a lot of international recognition for the project as well. Also because we did use blockchain technology for this. Um, and um, yeah, we inspired a lot of others. So we had other NGOs that contacted us to replicate our projects. We started different projects from that as well, such as um, clean nutrition, uh, agriculture, um, skills training, like a lot of different things. So that's definitely a beautiful project that I'm very proud of, yeah. And we've reached uh, 3,000 people so far. Uh, can you explain more uh, how, how blockchain technology actually helps in implementing uh, your projects? Sure. So as I mentioned earlier, um, the problem we had was that um, these saving groups, they always put their information in books. So they just write them down. They will put down how much money was saved, how much, how many loans they were given out, was the loan paid back. 
And as I said, one of the books was uh, eaten by a pig, so all the information was lost. So they didn't know who had what loan, and it was really terrible. And also me sitting in a different country, I had no information, I had no access to this, but it was important for me to analyze the information to see if the projects were going well. So the way we use blockchain technology is we work with the Danish provider um, who has developed a very simple phone app that they use on their local phones. So each group has a minimum of, of one smartphone. Um, very simple phones, they cost like about 50 US dollars. They're not very complicated. And they put in exactly that information in the app, which is based on the blockchain. So the way blockchain technology works, um, it is immutable. So you cannot, like nobody can, can change or fake the information. Everyone would be notified of that. So once you put in the information, like a $50 loan was given out or was paid back a week later, um, that information is safe and nobody could change that. And if somebody tried to change it, I would be notified right away. So it keeps our project super transparent. I can access all the information um, at any point. It's still super secure because only a limited number of people have access to this information. Um, but we could exp extend it to others as well if we wanted to. So, and it was super cheap. The project cost a couple of US dollars a month, basically, which is really important for development cooperation. And um, also wrote a paper about this. And there's a lot of international interest um, in this topic as well. So the key takeaway is that blockchain technology is necessary as pick its book. <laughs> anyway, yeah, if, it, uh, if, it, if a pig uh, eats a book, yeah, it is helpful for sure. <laughs> so, what, what do you think uh, are the biggest challenges uh, facing in, uh, impact businesses today, and how can they overcome overcome them? I think um, professionalization is the key challenge i think a lot of them improvise a lot so you have this huge passion for impact right you want to do good it's the same that i had um i'm trained in social science and in international relations i was never trained in business i was never trained in finance any of the harder skills right and i think uh, that can be similar for a lot of entrepreneurs or maybe they come from a business background but then they don't have a lot of other things so i think it's very important from the very get-go to understand what skills you still need to add and then either get team members in that help you with that or do the training courses yourself so you at least have a good basic understanding of that um, and then as well a lot of the ideas are not scalable which is frustrating for an investor to see so i think from the very get-go think about how can your business be sustainable and how can it be scaled so how could it be replicated in other areas or other countries as well because that's when your impact business becomes <clears throat> really interesting um, as well and easier as well to get investors in later or just to spread your, your scale, uh, the scale of your projects. And I think these points are really important to consider and also to network, network, network. So a lot of your problems could be solved really quickly if you just have people in your network that can help you. Like I have friends who are lawyers or I have friends who are blockchain experts and it gives me answers very quickly without me having to know all these details of myself, yeah. Excellent. So you're saying that you were not a training business. Or... So what are uh, some of the key qualities that you think are necessary to be successful in the field of international development and so, uh, social impact? Mm, passion. First one is passion. You need to have such a deep passion, which um, I have, and I think most people in impact have it. Um, because if you have the passion and also curiosity, I think one thing you really need is um, being very open to change and to learn. So if you're somebody who's just like, oh, you know, new technology or new developments in the world, I don't care about it. I like how it used to be. Um, not a good entrepreneurial quality, like always be curious and be open for the new things because they can teach you so much. Like I never had a tech background, for example, but I see so many genius tools that I can use for development cooperation. I think that's super important. And then also be a people's person, or if you're not, find somebody who's a people's person who can partner with you, um, because your network will be getting you so far. And a network can be as simple as like your friends or people you've worked with or your colleagues. Um, 
but create a strong community around you that will help you go further um, in your impact. And I think what I've experienced is that um, I talk with a lot of passion usually about my projects and that's what inspires people. So then they say like, mm, okay, this is interesting. I would love to do something like that as well because a lot of people have thought about impact in their lives. Like here in, in uh, Switzerland, for example, a lot of people will talk about sustainability, but they've never implemented anything. They just talk about it. But once you show them specific projects, um, they actually get inspired and they want to do, implement something as well, or they want to work with you maybe, maybe a new collaboration with a corporation where they work at or something could pop up for you. Uh, I think that is really cool, yeah. Great. So what do you think are some of the biggest misconceptions people have about investing? How do you address them? About impact investing? Yes. Yeah. Um, I think in the past, the past years, a lot of people doubted that impact investing could make a return on investment. So they doubted how effective it was. Um, a lot of people remained in traditional investments because they thought, you know, um, and then people who are more from my background, like the social background or the development corporation background, we were skeptical about impact investing because we thought that it's more like greenwashing, impact washing, basically. So that um, it's still the situation now, like some of the big banks, you can still only invest in products that are maybe a little bit better than traditional um, um, corporation efforts, but it's not really impact yet. So those were definitely some of the prejudices that people have, but I see the impact uh, sector really moving forward now and also going more in the direction where we we can really reach the poorest of the poor um, with impact investing as well but it's still quite high level so most of the impact investing that i know facilitated by family offices or banks or um whoever it's very focused on like investing in very big companies so they'll invest in india and in africa in different um, places but um yeah very high level and huge investment sums so i don't see so much investment in smaller businesses for example impact businesses yet but that's one of my missions bridging that excellent so can you describe a time you had to navigate a difficult ethical dilemma in your work and how did you resolve it oh an ethical dilemma that's a good one um i think actually when i started with investment myself and i wanted to have everything in impact investing but i had a lot of investments in traditional investments already so then uh which had nice returns so then i had to figure out how to solve that and um restructure my own investment portfolio to really focus on only impact investments as well yeah if that makes sense. Uh, yeah. And How also, I think, sometimes, yes. I think sometimes an ethical dilemma I have as well, as well, like for my work, I have to fly to a lot of different countries and that's not good for the environment. So that's something I struggle with a lot, but I know that I have to do the trips because often my presence is important or I have to meet people on the ground or I have to learn something there or, yeah. But I think that's definitely an ethical dilemma that I constantly have, like too many flights and yeah. So you're saying, you're talking about environment. It has a lasting impact on the communities you work with. You were gone again, your connection. Hello? Your audio was gone again for Am a second. I... Yes. How do you ensure that uh, your work is sustainable and has a lasting impact uh, on the communities you work with? Mm. Um, I would say I usually think about models from the very get-go that are sustainable so that I ensure that my, my involvement, like with my projects in Uganda, only needs a limited time frame and also limited involvement by myself so that I just facilitate, um, for example, uh, teaching about the tools that are useful for sustainable development, but that after that, they can take it on by themselves. And for example, for Uganda, I chose the Village Saving and Loan Associations, 
because that's a model where usually um, these groups inspire other groups. So neighboring villages, they will observe what's going on in my groups and they get jealous and then they get, um, they ask these groups to teach them how to do it. And this is how it spreads. So it had, has nothing to do with me anymore after the first year. Um, they do everything by themselves. And also we work with really skilled local people. So there I work with a super skilled NGO and external experts and they do everything themselves. So I hear about it, what's going on, which other organizations they're advising, but I don't have to be there. So it's very sustainable models. And we also get the feedback from the communities and you can see how even within one year, two years, there's great results already. Um, and also any follow-up projects, they're always discussed with them um, on how to move forward. So you, were, uh, you mentioned uh, in places. So how has your in experience in interning at the Global Center uh, for the responsibility to protect in New York influenced your work in promoting effective development cooperation? Hmm. I was, that was one of my first intern placements. I was in New York. I was 22 at the time. Um, and I had just been back from South Africa working in the slums and working for different um, other organizations. And it was very high level. So what we did over there, I was just an intern, but we went to advise the United Nations, um, also the ambassadors of different countries and it was on very tough situations. So it was Syria, it was Libya, um, all the massive wars that were going on in the, at the time. Now they're dealing with Ukraine, for example. Um, and I actually, to be honest, I found it very frustrating. So it was very interesting for me to do this kind of work. But I realized that I visited them a couple of years later and I realized that they were still dealing with Syria. They were still advising the ambassador and nothing had really changed. Syria had gone to a really bad place. Um, and... Um, for me, it really showed me that I wanted to work more with actual development projects, not the high level advisory of ambassadors, because I found it a bit inefficient. And I felt that for myself, I really wanted to work directly with communities to actually see the change. And then once I see that an, an initiative works really well, then take it to a higher level, maybe spread it throughout the whole country. Um, in Uganda, we're planning to scale our projects now to affect more areas. But I think I can achieve more change with that than um, the way it had worked back then. But it was a fascinating internship. I was in the middle of New York. Um, I got to speak to many of the super high level people, um, like the boss of the International Criminal Trial, for example, um, or United Nations ambassadors. And uh, it was absolutely fascinating. Yeah, but it was not what I wanted to pursue longer in my life. Great. So you work with uh, so many organizations. Can you tell us about a particularly inspiring individual or organization you have worked with in your career and why they were inspiring to you? <laughs> I'll give you um, one of my acquaintances, actually. She's a lady from Namibia and uh, Africa, Southern Africa. And she has beautiful social businesses that she started. Um, and one of them, for example, connects the farmers in the countryside to the city people with their produce because Namibia imports 70 to 80 percent of all their vegetables and fruits. Can you imagine? They have everything internal in their country, but they have to export it from other countries because they don't know what's going on within the country. So she created an app and also she travels like she sends trucks to the farmers in the, in the distant provinces. Um, who are usually not well connected to the market to um, get the information from them, also take the produce to the big cities. So that's just one of her, um, her companies. And I remember she was raising just 20,000 US dollars to get this um, project that is for the whole country off the ground, which I found super inspiring. She has another project that um, brings a thousand digital jobs to underprivileged women. Um, who usually wouldn't have a job otherwise um, because digital skills is something that you can often learn within a couple of weeks and then you can connect people to the international market. So I think brilliant project as well. And she is starting an impact fund right now. So an investment fund 
um, of a couple million actually so that she can fund more of these initiatives by herself in the future. So that's definitely somebody in the last couple of months that has inspired me a lot and I wish I would know more people like her because um, she's really good with both the money, the sustainability of the projects um, and finding solutions to problems where usually would, you would just have charity. Excellent. Uh, can you um, can you mention the services uh, Yes Impact provides? The services, yes, sure. So Yes Impact is a consulting company, uh, most of all. So I work with clients in, um, for example, NGOs, corporations, investors, um, and startups as well in implementing the sustainable development goals in innovative ways. So the blockchain project is an example, but could be anything else as well. Uh, we work with different topics from governance and anti-corruption to gender empowerment to social business and impact investing. Um, secondly, is a project company so that um, it creates custom-made projects for clients um, such as my ones in Uganda or in Nigeria, we work with my microcredits and then I'm also a keynote speaker. So those are, are the three pillars of Yes Impact. And then what I do a lot uh, more on an informal level is um, work with uh, entrepreneurs as well and connect them with investors. Excellent. So you mentioned empowerment. In your opinion, what are some of the most effective strategies for promoting gender empowerment in social business and impact investing? Mm, I think enabling people to be their own advocate, but also a lot of awareness raising. I realize that it doesn't matter what country you're in. It really doesn't matter if you're somewhere in South America, in Europe, um, or in Bangladesh. Um, a lot of people don't understand what other people are feeling. So you want to open up the debate. I remember when we first talked about the topic of um, sexual abuse, for example, hashtag Me, Me Too movement. Um, and a lot of the uh, men were actually saying like, yeah, but women are just provoking. So we really had to open up the dialogue and um, talk about these situations with them and also um, talk about how um, both men and women are affected by this topic. So both men can be victims, women can be victims. And that is the same um, with all of that. And I, I think something we realize in Europe lately a lot, and which will be a new trend topic soon as well, is that we're always talking about uh, women discrimination. But then a lot of the men, they realize now they never, they have a very toxic masculinity image. They can never, uh, a lot of the men here in Europe, they don't have enough close friends, for example, because they don't open up about their problems. They feel alone, they feel misunderstood. Um, so I think it's important to show both sides as well understand each other's problems, um, talk about it, and yeah, then create strong networks. So that means you wanna have, for your female entrepreneurs, for example, you wanna have good financing opportunities. You wanna make it visible to them. You wanna have a strong community where they can talk about the issues as well. Um, yeah. And then, I mean, from a European perspective, the first thing is you want to work on household responsibilities and stuff like that, because you have women and men working the same in the workplace. But then at home, a lot of stuff still falls on the women, which is very archaic and uh, not really necessary. Um, but that's another debate. Yeah. Okay, so how COVID-19 pandemic has impacted the field of international development and social impact. And how have you adapted to these changes? Oof, it was very rough actually for the whole international development world and social impact um, because you have so many countries and a lot of Europeans didn't know about it where people were not allowed to leave the house so they were not allowed to work. So whereas in richer countries, you just have your fridge at home and you have everything stored. In a lot of countries, people were actually starving and they could not make more money because they couldn't leave the house. Um, so we had entire countries and villages where people were just dying away. And then uh, for development cooperation, it was difficult because you couldn't travel to the country. So you didn't know what was going on. We only had the online meetings. Um, on the other hand, what I found advantageous was from the sustainability perspective and efficiency. Um, I started my projects completely remote. So that meant there were no administration costs whatsoever, only my local staff in Uganda. 
um, also was better for the environment. For three years, two and a half years, I never traveled there. So I think it showed development cooperation that a lot can be done remote, which is super cool. Um, you need to have good trust with your partners on the ground, uh, which is not always possible. But as I mentioned, like with new technologies, be it the internet or be it um, blockchain, you can make your work more transparent as well. And you can use these tools for accountability as well. So I think that was a really interesting um, experience. Yeah. For myself, my own company, the day that COVID started, I lost all of my clients in one day, basically, because a lot of my work was uh, focused on travel. But for me, it was a moment of reinventing myself. So I focused a lot on providing different services, online services, learning how to do that in a really good way. And I think that was the same for a lot of social impact organizations and businesses. Like they really had to it filter out who was more traditional and who could adapt to the new world, basically, and the new conditions. So really tested who could be innovative as well in a challenging situation. And as an entrepreneur, that's a really important skill to have. So COVID has uh, brought so many changes in the field of impact business. Uh, how do you think uh, what do you think some uh, are some of the key trends and changes we can expect in the field of international development and social impact in the coming years? Mm, I think you will have more players in the field. So you'll have more people like now, for example, past years you had corporations being in this field, but more a bit more superficially still. So they had their corporate social responsibility, but that meant more, maybe they build a school somewhere in Africa or something like that. But I think now, you have a moment momentum where both technology companies or others, they get deeper into it. They partner with governments or um, NGOs as well to really explore how their expertise can be used. Um, maybe that still takes longer than five years until that's really effective, but I'm really looking forward to really cool collaborations coming uh, into the sphere now. And also there will be more money available, I think, because impact investing is going higher and higher and will reach people um, at the moment, it's still more on the luxurious side, I would say. But I think in the future, it will definitely reach more like the middle class or the poor uh, people as well with the investment. So smaller social businesses could get more funding as well, um, which are really interesting developments. Um, yeah. And I think in general, people will move a bit away from charity, not completely, of course, there's many things that need charity money, definitely super important. But a lot of organizations will rethink uh, which um, areas of their work they will do as social businesses, so more uh, with business principles or as charity. Great. So uh, advice for someone who is interested in investing in impact business but is new to the field i would say start small so first of all you can really look at maybe some of the stocks and etfs out uh, that are out there with good companies um, so research if you're investing in the stock market um, research the company um, do they have good uh, environmental social and governance factors for example this is how you can start with impact investing and then um, you can always i mean there's uh, I work as a business angel as well. So business angel invests in businesses directly. Um, here in Europe, it's usually, you can start with like 5,000, 10,000 um, US dollars in other countries might be a, a smaller or, or higher amounts. And there you can really have an impact. So you can choose a business that's focused on climate change, for example, on sustainability, on um, helping with education and become a business angel there. And that's definitely a form of impact investing as well. Um, another thing is microcredits. Your country is famous for microcredits, 2 million people saved from poverty um, through microcredits as well. And there's different providers where you can get an ethical return. That's important. Don't go for any of the loan sharks that claim their microcredits and are charging like 50% or something in interest. Um, really go for an ethical one and um, you can invest through that. And that's a great start for impact investing. Me, I love microcredits because it's such small amounts. Like in Bangladesh, some of the amounts would be, I think, uh, maybe like $50, $100, maybe up a little bit um, in the countryside. But you can have such an impact on a person's life. And I have several microcredits in the world and I love seeing how it changes. 
um, entire families or even villages. And I think that's one of my favorite ways of impact investing. Yeah. So, <laughs> how do you balance? Thank you. So how do you balance being a successful entrepreneur, investor, and philanthropist while also serving on va uh, various boards and being a widely requested international expert and keynote speaker? <laughs> For me, I mean, one feeds into the other, right? So I will be active in my projects, like my Uganda projects. I do pro bono. I'm not getting paid for those, for example, um, but I love doing them. Um, but I get to speak to them uh, during a keynote speech as well, or they teach me good lessons for my consulting as well. Um, and uh, me, I love being busy with a lot of different things because I love learning. I'm super curious. And um, this way I get to have more and more experiences, but I will expand my company now to have more helpers as well, more um, assistance, so I can manage some of the uh, more administrative sides of all of that. Um, but I actually love how it's going and learning each area. Um, but I'm also realizing that, for example, my consulting business, I've had it for how many years now? Five, five and a half years. And some of these topics I know so much by heart now. I do the same work again and again. So I feel like this part of the consulting business I will um, outsource to um, employees um, who will do that so that I have more time for other things as well, like the mentoring, the keynote speaking. Uh, I want to write a book as well, another one. And um, yeah, I want to have more time for that. Amazing. So uh, I. First, has commented. Uh, let me. Islam has commented, "Great job." Uh, Muhammad uh, has commented, "Nice to have Louis Amershiver on SAT webinar." Uh, Johirul Islam has commented, "Great session." So, uh, we are almost at the end of the session, but I have one last question for you, which is: uh, Our organization, School of Entrepreneurship Development, is working uh, towards driving, working towards um, creating. An entrepreneurial life with so what do you have? say it again you were gone again hello am i audible to you yes so your organization is working on entrepreneurship this i got and then what was the question our organization is working to uh, create an entrepreneurial drive within the youth so what do you have to uh, say about that mm. I think uh, I love that. I love your school. I mean, I was uh, talking to uh, to your colleague already. Um, and I think so much, I speak to people from different countries, especially youth, and the worst is not having hope and opportunities, right? Like this feeling when you know, like, even if you go to university, you feel like you cannot get a good job. I think that's terrible. I wish I had known about entrepreneurship when I was younger. I didn't really know about it when I was like 15 or 18. I only thought about university and being employed in an NGO. That was my goal. But you have all these opportunities nowadays. I mean, go on TikTok. There's so many tips. I love it. Like you have the entire internet. I met my co-founder, uh, my co-founder, my colleague in Uganda on LinkedIn. So he's a super poor guy from, uh, from Uganda, but he used LinkedIn and he posted about his work. And this way I noticed him and he was a social entrepreneur. And now we have big projects together. He is represented on big stages in the world. I even mentioned him in my TED talk, like you can really use, and I'm sure all of you have internet or at least some access to internet, like um, use that. So get your inf information, um, learn some digital skills if you want, like see what are the trending topics, like how can you use chat GPT, how can you use, I don't know what's, what are the cool new topics, look out for trends as well, and then connect yourself with people on the internet, like you can speak to somebody from the United States, from Germany, um, you can even maybe connect with investors if you have a cool idea, and use the internet for publicity as well, so um, yeah, have a TikTok channel, have a LinkedIn profile. I don't know what works for you. You don't have to be everywhere. Like I use LinkedIn, that works for me. I don't use TikTok to post about myself because I'm too private for that. But, um, and then really choose something that you're passionate about. So maybe it's education. Maybe it's making sure that your sister is as recognized in society as you. Maybe it's creating a better future for your mom. Like, I don't know what it is, but focus on that. 
and then really think about how, is there maybe a business angle to it is there something that you could produce for this there where you can make an income with this as well so if you're working with unemployed youth for example why don't you start let's say you want to employ uh, hairdressers or something like that why don't you start like a simple school where they can sell their services for a cheap price and already make some money while doing that um, really think about that and if you're struggling with how exactly you can do it reach out to people online research it um, build a community around you as well so connect with others that have similar visions it doesn't have to be the same so I don't not all of my friends like actually few of my friends are doing exactly what I do a lot of them are in different areas but they love what I do and I love what they do so we support each other as well we're always at each other's events um, and I think the other thing I would say is do so don't just talk about it like even if you start with something small my first project I always wanted to do projects myself and I started three years ago in Uganda and the first thing was so tiny. It was a tiny donation that I gave, but it was all the money I had at the time um, to help them out of um, starvation, basically. But from that tiny project, I developed the next project and the, later I got donations in. So from a very, very tiny thing, you can develop so much mm -hmm. more. Same when we work with female founders. Sometimes we just organize an event with like 10 people where 10 women meet and discuss. But from there, maybe the next event will be a lot bigger or we get a lot of attention for this um i think this is so important thank you so much <laughs> louise thank you for taking the time to join us today it was great hearing about your experience and insights and your contribution to, to this field is truly inspiring so that's all from today's session uh, i hope i'll be hearing from you again um, and for the viewers thanks uh, for Thanks for um, being with us tonight. I hope you have found the session as informative as I have. Thanks again, Luis. Take care. Good night. Thank you so much. Have a good night.